Well, hey everyone, I am here with one of the, um, a very influential person in my life, Brother Scott McKnight, uh, which is not actually your, uh, I guess your title would be Dr. McKnight, right? Yes, uh, I'm not called that very often. My students call me by my name. Yeah, which is one of the great things about you. Um, Br Brother Scott has uh, written a, a lot of different books from Kingdom Conspiracy uh, to the one that we're going to talk about today, which I have read three different times, and it changed so, so much of what I think of when I think of the life of Paul, and it's so helpful for the seasons that we're in right now in living as an American or living in America. Um, just because I, I, I've said many times that racism is a Christian sin. It's a Christian idea. And I got that largely from you about mm -hmm. fellowship of difference and kind of the churches that Paul planted. Um, a lot of people might not actually know, Brother Scott, but before I moved to Little Rock, you and Miss Chris were uh y'all were the people that helped push me over the edge do you remember at pepperdine i do i do remember that yeah yeah that lunch and you saying you never regretted making decisions for your family versus yeah, yeah. I, that was such a word for me and uh i don't pleasant valley may um may credit you or blame you for that but thanks for I remember when I said this to you, Jonathan, you were kind of stunned. And I thought, yeah. I don't know if I said the wrong thing or the right thing, but that's what I believe. Yeah, well, it was helpful because I, I found myself thinking, you did all right in your career. And yeah. you just, yeah. So um, one of the things, you know, we're in, a, we're in a season of Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, and great racial unease and it feels like in a post-christian america some of the roots of of the resources that we have have been to to like be a part of the healing of the nations or a colony of heaven have been drained um in arkansas we have a history of you know Central High and the Little Rock Nine, but in Churches of Christ, um, Botham John, who was a black student at Harding University, a graduate of Harding, um, he was uh, shot last year, or I think it was 18 months ago, by a Dallas police officer off duty, and that was a thing that kind of galvanized a lot of people in churches of Christ because they knew Bo mm -hmm. and they knew him as a good and godly man. And they, they all of a sudden were starting to realize um, maybe some things aren't right in our country and we need to start listening to our brothers and sisters of color. Your book, A Fellowship of Difference, five or six years ago is what got me uh, to put together a bus ride with 10 black preachers and 10 white preachers in our fellowship mm. to go on a trip of uh, through the civil rights movements and just listen to each other's stories. And because it was such a galvanizing book for me, I was wondering, could you say something for PV and, and for our maybe broader fellowship even today on what Paul was up to in the world, what were the early churches that Paul planted like? Yeah, this is, um, yeah, we are in a difficult time, Jonathan. And um, the only thing that I can reconnect with it, I'm old enough to remember the 60s, the late 60s, actually, in the early 70s. And this is, this reminds me of that. I think the, the late 60s were more intense because mm -hmm. it was, it was the first time you saw people protesting with this much strength. Um, but the Apostle Paul, I think in many ways, uh, provides a template uh, for us to consider and reconsider how we do ministry 
Paul was doing something nobody had ever done. He was out on a mission. And I studied Jewish missionary activity in my PhD days. And there was nothing like this, nothing like the Apostle Paul. There were occasional converts and people clapped their hands. But this was, the Apostle Paul was full bore ahead. Go into the major cities of Turkey, today's Turkey, the Roman Empire, Asia Minor, go to the synagogue, announce when you get your chance, you know, in between comments. I don't know exactly how it worked in those synagogues, but Paul somehow managed to find a way to talk, and he announced that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah. And it didn't take long, and he was getting opposition because he would not back down from the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. But he also discovered in those synagogues and outside the synagogues, because he turned his tent-making skills, his let's say his work booth, his workplace, into a place of conversation and dialogue and evangelism. He discovered many Gentiles were coming to believe. And, um, and while Paul can see his whole mission as a mission to the Gentiles, I think he only learned the scriptures about the Gentiles in the hubbub of his experience with Gentiles coming to faith. And he'd go back to the Bible. You say what? You know. And he was reading the Bible as if for the first time hmm. on what's God going to do with Gentiles and how do we relate to non-Jews? And when a Gentile becomes a believer, do they have to be circumcised? Hmm. Do they have to marry within the people of Israel? And all these problems. I mean, you're a Gentile. You're a Jewish man. Your name is Reuben. Your daughter, Rebecca, Becky, falls in love with a young man named Theodore, who's a Gentile, and he's a Greek speaker. And you're sitting there thinking, yeah, I believe in, I believe that the church is bigger than a nation. It's bigger than one ethnic group. But I don't like this idea of my, my daughter marrying a Gentile. This was yeah. common for Paul. And Paul searched the scriptures. And I believe also, Jonathan, that, and, and the, the PV people can, can think about this, it was the power of the Spirit that gave these people a transformed heart and yeah. transcendent abilities to be able to bring into their fellowship Gentiles that formerly were seen as pagans and live with them in fellowship as siblings or brothers and sisters in Christ. These are yeah. huge huge um, thresholds to cross in the early church. And Paul, uh, Paul is sent out on mission, and there is no template, there is no blueprint, there is no manual. Everything was learned by experience. Uh, it's it's amazing story yeah. as we begin to recognize the challenges that were ahead of this guy as he began to evangelize and find Gentiles coming to faith in Christ, and they had all these debates. I mean, we're going to have a banquet. Well, we're going to have a barbecue. Do we serve <laughs> pork? You know, this is this is a big issue. Do, yeah. we, do we have shrimps on the barbecue, you know? I mean, are these things legit? And um, it was one thing after another that they had to work through. And for us, you know, I know I don't, I don't worry about pork sandwiches and shrimp. Um, we don't cook shrimp on our barbecue. Our, our, <laughs> our shrimp aren't that big, but um, um, we don't we don't worry about these things. But these were major issues in the early church. Yeah, just like for me, I remember when the NIV came out, and that what pastors just said, no, that's for home Bible reading. We have God's Word, the King James Version in the pulpit on Sunday, and that's all there is to it. And I remember my pastor, my youth pastor, told me I could read the NASB, but I shouldn't bring it to church. <laughs> but he did let me bring it eventually on Sunday nights. 
Yeah, that, that doesn't count. So, yeah, Nobody doesn't worried count. about on Sunday night services about what Bible you got. They're just glad you're there. So, yeah. So, so at, at one point in your book, A Fellowship of Difference, which I can't recommend highly enough, I mean, I really would consider it one of the most influential things I've read in understanding the New Testament. Um, you You talk about how in America, we do our churches like we do our salad. Do you mind talking about that for a second? You know, um, the book was originally going to be called, uh, um, uh, let's see, Life in a Salad Bowl. And my editor does not like salads. <laughs> so he wouldn't let me call it that. But I saw a salad on his Facebook page the other day, and I reminded him. Uh, at one point, told me to like salad. So, all right, Americans, um, when we eat salads, this is, I watch people do this. They go through maybe a salad bar, and they put all their little things in it. They're, they're all prepared. They put all their things in their bowl, and then they just drench it with salad dressing. All right. So let's just say that's, that's a typical way. Other, no one does this, but you could see people doing it who are really detail-oriented. They put each different item of their salad in a different bowl or in a different spot on their plate, and they eat them separately. All right, now let me use these two illustrations uh, in order to go to a third. In the, in the last one, that's a little bit what church is like in the United States, and this has been a, an observation of church leaders for many, many years that we have African American churches, we have Asian American churches, and Latin American churches, and we have Churches of Christ, and we have the Christian Church, and we have the Disciples of Christ. Of course, these are the three most important groups in God's eyes, the Stone Camel movement and the Restoration <laughs> uh, Just kidding. I, I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, I, yeah. You're I, know wrong. Your, you're I know your story. I love, I love your people. And then you do. Hey, let me pause and just say, you you have you love Church of the Christ because of how much we love the Bible, right? That's right. That's right. And and you know, I in in this book you even quote Randy Harris, who yeah. is you know like my spiritual director and mentor and stuff. And you've been very good to our fellowship, brother Scott. So you, can, you feel free to yeah. poke. Yeah. Okay, and then there's Presbyterian churches and Methodist churches and Baptist churches, and there's 125 kinds of Baptists in the United States or in the world, and all these churches, and they're like people who eat their salad uh, separately. They got a little spinach, a little broccoli, maybe some raisins and nuts, and then they got maybe some radishes and some maybe some kale and some chard and iceberg lettuce. Then there's other people, and I, and I have used this one already, is that they put it all in a bowl and then they drench it. And I, I compare that to, you can all come to our church, but we all have to taste alike. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, that is the, almost the coercion of group pressure, that the only people who feel comfortable is a radish that tastes like Thousand Island dressing. So you don't taste the radish. Yeah. This is unfortunate because um, when Paul said you know, in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male and female, he wasn't wiping out distinctions. He wasn't saying, right. you're not going to be a Gentile anymore, or you're not going to be a Jew, or you're not going to be a slave, and you're not going to be free. These things didn't change. Men remain men, and women remain women. He wanted them to transcend their differences in a unity in Christ while at the same time celebrating their differences. When yeah. I'm with the Jews, Paul says, I'm a Jew. When I'm with the Gentiles, I'm a Gentile. I, I believe, some of my scholarly friends don't agree with me, but I think when Paul was on the mission road uh, and he was with all Gentiles and they served uh, pork on the barbie, he said, it's pretty good stuff. Mm -hmm. I like pork barbecue. Do you have some coleslaw? Now, is that okay? Yeah. Is that, okay? that is the way it's supposed to be in Arkansas. Yeah. Okay. So, I, and I, so Paul knew the, the differences, and he celebrated, I think. Yeah. But I think that there's a, a Christian way of making a salad. That is, mix them all together, 
and then use olive oil because it will enhance the taste. You don't ever drench your salad with so much olive oil that you can't taste the salad. It mm -hmm. might get a little bit more olive oil taste. Uh, it might get your intestines going a little bit more than you want, but the, the, the individual items, the broccoli, the carrots, the radishes, the olives, the nuts, you will still taste them. Yeah. Because the olive oil has a way of enhancing the taste on our tongue and everything else. That's what I think the church should be. We, right. we have the oil of the Holy Spirit that can put us in the body of Christ and unite us with this oil, and yet at the same time enhancing our differences. That's right. You know, I've, I've been in the South. I know the difference between a Northerner and a Southerner. My, my mom and dad, my mom and dad were both from Southern Illinois and resonated far more with Southerners than they did with Northerners. Mm. So I kind of grew up as a Southerner in Northern Illinois. And of course, we're not true Southerners. We're not south of the Mason-Dixie line, but in my head, in their heads they were. And um, there are differences. As long as we don't degrade someone else mm -hmm. in the church and say, you know, I recognize that you're different, but I really like the difference that you bring to the table. And yeah. I hope you'll appreciate the difference that I bring to the table. Now, we don't do this in a patronizing way. You know, we're going we're gonna to let you sing your gospel spiritual spirituals on, on one evening a year, and we're going to all clap and, and feel good about ourselves because we've explored African American culture. No, that's mm. that's tokenism and that's just patronizing. No, we want to bring them to the table and learn from them as yeah. they learn from us. And we then become an expanded body of Christ where we enjoy one another as siblings in Christ and we become a unified body. Yeah. At, at one point in your book you talk about you know, the, the different, you know, Asian American, African American, Caucasian uh, churches. And then you go even further and you say uh, churches for men and not women, church for wealthy and not and for middle class and churches for the poor, um, churches for liberals, churches for fundamentals, churches for people who follow Calvin, Wesley, Luther, Aquinas, Hybels, Warren, Rick, uh, Andy Stanley. Matt Chandler, Mark Driscoll, church becomes on Sunday morning an exercise in cultural and spiritual segregation, and that has a huge impact on the Christian life itself. And the, the reason that I think uh, our fellowship and you track so often is we, that's what we were trying to do originally. We were trying to be non-denominational before it was cool. Yeah, um, I remember that. Back, David Lipscomb was really, really big during the Civil War on, and you've spoken at Lipscomb, you know about Lipscomb University, and okay. yeah, David Lipscomb was really big on uh, helping black brothers and sisters in the South during all of that, because like, they were a part of the body of Christ. So w we had these instincts kind of early on but in some ways, while we, you know, said we're just going to be um, a non-denominational church, the race lines kept creeping in, even there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, oh, I know. And, and, and of course, this happened after World War, after the Civil War, is gradually there was, uh, especially in the South, um, and I'm not going to excuse the North on this because racism was was rampant in the North. And after the Great Migration, when so many African Americans moved North, they had to settle in, in uh, isolated areas because the whites in the North didn't accept them. So this is a national sin. This isn't a Southern sin. But there was a, there were uh, uh, you know lines drawn. I remember Jonathan as a young boy going to restaurants where I remember a door that said for coloreds only. Hmm. I'm, I'm old enough to remember. In your lifetime? In my lifetime, yes. Yeah. Uh, in Rockford, Illinois, I remember this. 
And I remember my father telling me that the athletic director at our high school had taken the, a basketball team that was one of the best in the state into a city and they didn't allow the African Americans to come into the restaurant. Because we used to always go out to eat as a team. They took us to restaurants as well before we competed or afterwards. And the athletic director said, well, if you won't take our African-American athletes, we're not coming in. Mm. And it made a huge impact on the culture of our high school because the coaches from that point on would only go to restaurants that would embrace African-Americans. Well, this is, huh. this is Christian. This is a Christian virtue that the Apostle Paul was one of the first in the world to propagate and to evangelize. He said, the gospel is for everybody. Yeah. And anybody who believes is a sibling. Mm. I mean, this is a radical decision. Yeah. You know, brothers and sisters, all of us, doesn't matter. If people are in Christ, they are my sibling. If God has accepted them, I have an obligation to accept them. And it trumps every other allegiance. Uh, yeah. I, I think I may have shared this with you before, but since I'm filming from my home, I would say I had a couple of different conversions in high school. And one was when I was baptized. And the next week was when I was riding with my friend right down this road and a black family had just moved in. And he wanted me to yell the N word at them. And I wouldn't do it. And then we got in a fist fight. So it wasn't my most Christian moment, but. I, as I and I lost the friendship and the fight, um, <laughs> but as I was walking away that day, I mean, this is this is one of those Holy Spirit kind of moments. I knew I was a Christian before I was an Arkansan, before I was a, a white person, before I was an American. I was a Christian, and it looks like Paul and the churches he planted is trying to get everyone to have some kind of moment like that, that but not whatever it looks like in everybody's individual life, but that e your fundamental allegiance is to King Jesus. Um, so uh, you, you spend a section of your book talking about who is invisible in our churches. And you do, you know, everything from people who are poor to people who are uneducated to widows to people who are um, not seen. These days, it seems like there's a lot of churches that may have people of different ethnicities worshiping together, but not seeing each other. You know, like uh, they call it code switching where you don't wanna say what it is your what your experiences are in front of somebody of a different ethnicity because you still want to be friends with that person you still want them to like you um, and so I think we have a lot of people and this is probably not just true of churches in in central Arkansas but also in our country a lot of people who are compartmentalizing their life at church and they're being invisible to each other. What do you think Paul and his gospel would say to that? Well, uh, you know, I, I don't want to, um, I'm churches of Christ enough to say, let's go back to the Bible, but, but I don't want to pretend like everything that happened in the first century was done perfectly and well. Mm. Uh, sometimes there were real mess ups, but the apostle Paul, this is, uh, he was exploring. He is trying out what it means to treat everybody as siblings. So Philemon is all about a slave yeah. who is now a brother. Yeah. You know, more than a slave. That's now, right. Everything. All right. Now, when you read Romans 14 to 15, you realize there's a lot of tension in that church between the strong and the weak. In Romans 16, we have a list of names. And two major scholars, but especially a German by the name of Peter Lambda, investigated every name in Romans 16 in light of all the inscriptions for these people 
in the ancient, the first century in the ancient world. And he concluded, and Robert Jewett then reworked the evidence and studied it as well. Um, Robert Jewett concluded, and with along with Peter Lampa, that the maybe as many as 75% of the Christians that Paul mentions by name in Romans 16 are slaves. Okay. Mm. Now these are people who were totally invisible in Roman households in most cases. Yeah. But Paul names them. Mm. You know, that, that slogan, people, what's, what's his name? What's her name? Name. Use the name. Say mm. it. And he's saying these names. Wow. And it's, it's, it's amazing. And a lot of these are just typical slave names. And so Paul is bringing to the surface people who are subsurface, uh, men and women. There's a lot of women mentioned in Romans 16 because they are active in ministries um, yeah. in, in the Roman church. There are slaves. There are men. There are some people who probably have some status. And there are yeah. people who have no status. So this is a paradigm. We have a whole letter of Paul writing about a guy named Onesimus, which I think uh, N.T. Wright translates Mr. Useful. Mm. You know, handyman. That's, yeah. a, that's a translation. Handyman. <laughs> that's good. That's good. That's the name, handyman. Yeah. And, and he becomes significant in the history of the church because mm. Paul made him visible. Our responsibility is to ask the question, who in our church is neglected and ignored. And we want to make them visible. Not neglected. We want to make them visible and known. Tell their story. Someone use their story in a sermon. Uh, yeah. You know, talk about it. Bring yeah. people's stories to the table. And my experience in churches is that when we hear the stories of our brothers and sisters in our own church, we like it. That's how, right. How many people in the church say, that's the first time I even knew that person, yep. and now I know them, and I just feel so good about that, and I want to get to know them because their daughter is a friend of my daughter, and I didn't even know them. Yeah, that's right. So make them visible. So you, you uh, have a section in there where you talk about the importance of defining love. Um, the I may be this book is a few years old, so I might be fresher on it than you are because I recently reread it. But you talk about uh, the importance of don't go to the Merriam Webster dictionary to get your definition of love when Paul is trying to get these churches to love. Do you remember your definition? Oh, oh yeah, I do remember it because I've slightly modified it. Okay. Oh, really? Yeah, in my book, uh, Pastor Paul. I think I have a, a slight revision, uh, but it's, it's still the same definition. Um, yes, we need, if we want to define love, we don't look at humans, we look at, or the dictionary, we look at God. God is love. We watch how God loves. God loves by making a rugged, affective, emotional, etc., commitment to be for someone and to be their advocate and to be, with, to be with them, to be for them, unto Christ's likeness as we grow together in Christ. So mm -hmm. it is a rugged, affective commitment to be with, to be for, and unto Christ's likeness as we grow with one another uh, in the kingdom of God. So, um, you know, C.S. Lewis once said, forgiveness is a lovely idea until you have something to forgive. That's right. Yeah. It's one of my favorite lines. I think I quote that one exactly right. Um, love is like that. Love is a wonderful idea until you have a new neighbor you don't like. That's right. Yeah. Uh, uh, so we need, we need that kind of definition of love because it really puts us on the spot. It says, yeah. Are you willing to make a rugged, affective commitment to be with that person, to be for that person, and to grow together in Christ? Mm. That's, that's what it means to love in a Christian sense. Now, we have neighbors who aren't Christians, so there's limitations on how far that can go. 
but we can make a rugged commitment to that person that that they will know that we are for them and that yeah. we love to be with them. You know, even though we think they're crazy, but we want to be with them. <laughs> you know, back to your kind of salad bowl analogy, towards the end of the book, you talk about a guy named, that's Peter, our rooster, talking right now. Um, at your salad bowl analogy, you, you, you come back to, well, you, Roger Williams, the guy who came up with the idea for freedom of church and state, but didn't he like start churches and then he would leave them and go start another church because uh, they weren't doctrinally pure enough or he didn't get along with somebody? Am I remembering that correctly? Oh, yeah, yeah. Roger Williams, I often use him as the illustration of a church of one. He was yeah. so he was so convinced that the church had to be so pure. I mean, he, he took anabaptism, say the restoration movement, and put it on steroids every morning, you know? Yeah. And, and his theory basically was uh, the only church worthy of his attendance and membership was one that followed everything in the Bible as he understood it. And eventually he's in uh, Rhode Island, Providence. There's a statue of him I've seen there. Uh, he's there and it's basically, he's all by himself with his family. Because no one was worthy of his fellowship because nobody lived up to his expectations. This is, this is a complete denial of the reality of the church. The church is not a country club for saints or a hospital for sinners. Mm. You know, it's for, it's for people who are growing in grace, not for people who've mastered grace. Ah, that's great. It does seem like Roger Williams and that impulse, while I can, I understand it because, you know, you, you feel like the church could be so much more and, and um, you know, you look to your left and right sometime on Sundays and you're like, wait a second but uh and people are looking at me thinking the same thing but it does feel like in a lot of ways that impulse reverses the apostle paul's mission that's right it does i mean look half of those jewish believers did not like those gentile believers mm -hmm. they didn't trust them those gentile believers thought those jewish believers were just uptight following the torah the law didn't need to. This is the age of grace. You know, we've got the Holy Spirit in us. Let's not worry about that. And and so they distrusted one another. Yeah. And in every community that Paul started, this was a tension between the Jewish and the Gentile believers. And Paul spent his whole life uh, trying to convince Jewish and Gentile believers that they were siblings. Mm. Raise money for probably 20 years or more to prove to the Jerusalem church that the Gentile churches that he was forming were in fellowship with the Jerusalem church. Yeah. And, so and his whole life was this. Yep, that's it. And, and basically, the you know, rest of the Christian tradition has been trying to wrestle with the same questions that Paul has introduced. You know, we're in an election year, Brother Scott, and without saying, you know, political candidates' names or anything, one of the Senate, and then, and then I'll let you go because I know you have a job and a life and stuff, but one of the things you say towards the end of the book is the best way to be political is to be the church. What do you mean by that? Well, I'm, I think that the church needs to avoid partisan alliances. Mm -hmm. When we align with a political party, I'm not saying that people can't vote. I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm saying, yeah. we align with that. We rule out the Christians on the other side. Mm -hmm. And that is about 50% in the United States. That's not good. But when the church is the church, it becomes a, you know, the Greek word for the church is ecclesia, and it yeah. refers to the assembly of voting citizens in a Greek city. Yeah. So it was a gathering of, in a sense, it was a political body. 
Mm. And that's the word they use for the church. It's a political uh, body of power. And the church needs to be a people that witnesses and embodies by living out and living in the flesh a way of life that tells the world that that's not the way to live. This yeah. is the way to live. So yeah. um, Stanley Hauerwas often has said that the responsibility of the church is to, is to tell the world, to show to the world that it is the world. Mm -hmm. We are the church. In other yeah. words, the way we live, we show the worldliness of the world. And the way we live, we show the lordliness of our Lord. Yeah. And so that becomes a politic. It becomes a body of people witnessing to an alternative reality where Jesus is the Lord and we embody the kingdom of God in this world in a way that shows up the world as sinful. That's, mm. I think that's part of our responsibility. That's it. I think, I think in seasons like this, we're called to be a colony of heaven. Yeah. That we're, that's the best way to be political. And if the divide of uh, racial lines or political lines or what generational lines, educational lines has made fissures in our church, then we're somehow falling short of who Jesus is calling us to be and, and the kind of churches Paul planted. I agree. I totally agree. Brother Scott, I thank you so much for your time. Thanks for uh, talking with us today. And um, thank you for writing that book. I highly recommend it to anybody who is um, interested in, in what does the Christian faith have to say in seasons like this? Yeah. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Good to be with you and your people. And it's uh, good to see your face. Good to see you, Brother Scott. Yeah, I know. Tell Miss Chris I said I. Uh, I will. Okay.